Hi, my name is Ben Hutton and it's a privilege to speak to you here at ASC this year. Hopefully you're here because you're interested in JSON schema, otherwise you've got the wrong talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a JSON schema at home in the OpenAPI specification, core concepts, vocabularies, and drafts for 2020. A JSON schema is something I work on in the evenings and weekends, and we have a small amount of funding for which we're very grateful. Uh, this is going to be a brief introduction to those concepts, uh, but hopefully it will encourage you to find out more and ask questions. So, JSON Schema is just a, a personal draft in the IETF world. The website is uh, out of date sometimes, the docs are a little inaccurate occasionally. Does anybody actually use JSON Schema in production? And it turns out quite a few well known companies and some great scientific projects use JSON Schema. It's baked into VS Code, no plugins are required. Uh, JSON configuration files and autocomplete validation. JSON schema. It's used in Webpack to validate package files. It's used in MongoDB for structural validation. It's used by Mozilla and Firefox uh, for telemetry data. Um, and it's also used for the Mozilla Developer Network um, documentation of some of their data as well. And now, or rather soon, OpenAPI 3.1 will support JSON schema fully for payload validation. But before sharing with you why I'm so excited for JSON schema being at home in the OpenAPI specification, it's always helpful to refresh on key terminology and basic concepts, especially to make sure I don't get confused. JSON schema is still JSON. JSON and works within the JSON data model. It's mainly used for validation, uh, but it also provides annotations, which is useful for understanding the instances. It provides extensibility with vocabulary support, and it can be used uh, for UI generation, but this is not part of the standard. And as I mentioned, it's proudly baked into Visual Studio Code. It's key to understand uh, that some locations in a schema can be a schema itself. This is uh, called a subschema, and they are fully fledged JSON schemas in their own right. An instance is a JSON to which we want to apply the schema. It's all to do with applicability of schemas. And a meta schema is a JSON schema which describes a JSON schema. Now, the spec document is always the single source of truth, and the meta schema is provided as a convenience. Occasionally, some of those have inaccuracies, which we always want to correct. JSON schema works in JSON land, and we have validation keywords for the different types supported in JSON. For 2020 draft, there is support for advanced use cases beyond an instance which is only encoded in JSON, such as binary data in a multi-part form. But that's a rather complex use case for now. Applicability is key. Everything starts by applying the JSON schema to the instance. Defining uh, different keywords can apply subschemas to different parts of the instance, and the keywords in those schemas provide assertions or annotations as a result. Assertions are about validity, giving you a yes or no result, and annotations provide additional metadata about the instance, some of which can be some of which are used to determine the behavior of other keywords. Structural keywords and schemas and schema reuse make it easy to author complex multi-file schemas or indeed sets of schemas. We talk about references in terms of URIs and URI resolution processes are used when determining the reference schema. $ref, $anchor are used for referencing and $id identifies a schema resource. Dynamic anchors allow for anchors to work across schema resources, which is useful when creating meta schemas for new vocabularies, which adds keywords allowed by a schema, which includes subschemas. Otherwise, there's a lot of duplication and it's quite complex. So let's talk about dialects. Dialects and vocabularies are all to do with the extensibility of JSON schema. 
to help us understand what these terms mean, let's take a look at a section of the 2019-09 meta schema. The key of the vocabulary keyword, uh, the keys of the vocabulary keyword objects are the URIs which identify the vocabularies. Draft 2019-09 doesn't define what's at the end of these URIs if they're network addressable, um, but there may be some sort of human readable documentation associated with that vocabulary. We reserve the, the right to define that at a later point. The values of the object are billions. For the JSON schema specification, support for format is not actually required, hence the value is false. Uh, this is one of the oddities of formats that's existed for a long time. However, for the purposes of validation, a schema, or purposes of validating a schema, the requirements of a format key must be a string, so the meta schema for the format is still referenced. The values of vocabulary tells the processing implementation that vocab work vocabularies uh, they need to understand to process the instance to the author's expectations. For other meta schemas, this may include purposes beyond validation, such as creation of forms or code generation with additional semantics. Let's take a look at uh, dialects of vocabularies in a bit more detail. The standard dialect uh, for JSON schema is the core and validation specifications constructed by several vocabularies. Dialect vocabulary keyword provides a standardized method to define required and optional support for implementations via the meta schema. Being able to extend existing meta schemas is a common use case, but it's also very difficult, as some of you will be aware. It's important to note that the vocabulary keyword is only for use in meta schemas, with the dollar schema in a JSON schema identifying which dialect via the associated meta schema is required. Let's take a look at reuse uh, of schemas using Dollar and what this means for 2019-09 and how that's different. Uh, this isn't so important for pure validation use cases, uh, but it is important for the output of validation intended to be used by other tools or tools which want to generate forms or other documentation or, oh, excuse me, or other documentation as a result of processing. Prior to 2019-09, a ref would result in other keywords in the same schema object being ignored or replaced if they already existed. If we look on the left-hand side, uh, the schema on uh, in draft seven, uh, if you want to use keywords alongside ref, you need to wrap that inside a schema and wrap multiple schemas inside an all of applicator. For 2019 or 09, $ref now plays nicely with other keywords and doesn't just replace the whole object. Ref is now an applicator keyword, much like other applicator keywords, and simply references uh, the schema that's to be applied to the instance location. Don't forget that you still shouldn't define duplicate keys such as $ref in the same object. That's not JSON schema, that's just JSON. Let's take a look at annotation collection. Now, this is something that's optional, but is recommended for 2019-09. The community often asks us how they can get more detailed error information from implementations. MongoDB, for example, just reports errors or not. Sadly, it's not so much we can do about that. But what we have done is define several layers of standardized output. Flag is that is only flag is that required out of these levels. But we hope most implementations will provide at least basic levels. Some implementations have already provided detailed output level. Collecting the required information to generate the output may look like a lot of work, but annotation collection is required 
to support some of the lead keywords anyway. Do note that annotation collection is not required and so some implementations may not support keywords which require it. They must throw an error if that's the case and such implementations may have very basic use cases anyway. Let's look at flag level output. An object which must contain valid, which must be a boolean. In many cases, this is overkill. Um, the library may provide default behavior or simply return a boolean in the format appropriate for the language. But they may wish to also provide this format for interoperability or for digestion by other tools. After all, JSON schema is uh, designed to be a language and platform agnostic tool. Let's look deeper. Basic level shows an overall validation result and provides an array of errors. And we're excited to see how implementers process this data to provide errors to the end user. Finally, let's just mention briefly uh, detailed and verbose. Detail provides errors and a structure relating to the instance. And verbose is really for analysis, debugging, and other tools as opposed to general use cases. More about that in the specification itself. Let's look at ID and anchor. Reference resolution has always been tricky to understand, with the use of ID and subschemas affecting how references are resolved. So we decided to break ID into two keywords to try and simplify this problem. We didn't see name and name fragments used in pra practice very often. So we won't go over this in too much detail. Embedding or including or the technical term transclusion of one schema within another schema is a lot more common. Plain name fragments are for non-location specific identifiers. Previously when using dollar ID, intent can be unclear and many possible non-canonical URIs could be possible. There's a great appendix section about this if you want to look into the details. Uh, now, from 2019-09, ID cannot be a plain name fragment. Um, you must use anchor for plain name fragments. Remember the terminology here flows from URIs, which is its own specification and its own RFC. Let's have a look at dollar anchor. That's for plain name fragments, as I mentioned. It's not used very often, but helpful for schemas which are likely to be embedded in other schemas. Uh, it prevents potentially confusing use of, that, of uh, references. Uh, it's used um, when you want to include references which are not location specific. <clears throat> Let me just mention compound documents. We're still working out some of the finer details for draft 2020. <clears throat> the lot ID identifies the root of a schema resource, allowing identification of a compound document. Compound documents cannot be validated by applying a meta schema acting as an instance. This is the result of an I cross version and cross dialect referencing. Now let's move to the unevaluated keywords, which is new for 2019-09. The <clears throat> long last for keywords see through applicator keywords, allowing the restricting of properties to those defined in multiple schemas. So let's take a look at an example. It's easier if I show you this and talk through it, although it does have a slight error, which might be easy to make given the keyword's name. We tried to come up with a better name, but it turns out that's really hard. So let's look at this schema. The instance data we're imagining for the schema is made up of two parts, a person and a patient. The patient defines the patient ID and the patient details, whereas the person defines a required name and age. This is wrapped together in an all of on line 18 with two references, person and patient. A 
common use cases, we want to allow the fields to find in those two parts, but not any others. This is where unevaluated properties comes in, defining false, similar to additional properties, and it can see through the all of and reference applicators. We say see through, but this in practice works by collecting the annotation results of applying those subschemas to the instance location. This means that other applicators and other keywords must be executed or must be evaluated first before unevaluated properties. But there's something not quite right about this schema. As I mentioned, it works similar to additional properties, uh, which is not affected by the required keyword. Unevaluated properties is only affected by annotation results from properties, pattern properties, additional properties, or unevaluated properties. So to fix the schema, we must add the properties key to the first to the person object and define name and age in the person schema. We can set these uh, uh, the values of the properties object to simply true as we don't wish to express any constraints at the moment. So what's next for JSON schema? Very soon we're releasing a new draft 2020, mainly uh, with a minimal set of things we wanted to cover with the full 2020 draft, which are breaking changes. This is for the open API 3.1 to enable that release to happen sooner. We will follow up by releasing a small update based on work originally intended for 2020 draft, which won't quite make it. We're continuing to update the test suite and we want to focus on updating our educational resources and triaging existing issues. We'd like to spend more time on our linter tooling and define the path to standardization, uh, but this isn't a priority for us right now. So where can you go from here if you want to learn more about JSON schema? If you want to learn the basics of JSON schema, json-schema.org provides a great learning resource to get you off the ground. There's a more detailed guide on our subscene understanding JSON schema site, which is now under the JSON schema organization. If you want to play about with JSON schema, jsonschema.dev provides a nice playground to test validation using schemas and instances, and even provides shareable links to share with friends and colleagues. Stack Overflow is monitored by the JSON schema team. Any questions tagged with JSON schema will be identified to us. If you're looking for even more help, json-schema.org uh, json and join our Slack server. It's uh, got a vibrant community and we're always on hand to help out. So thank you all uh, to the previous and current team, the contributors in the community, implementation developers, and all of you. And finally, I mentioned our last sponsors, Async API Initiative, Stoplight, and our new sponsor, Retool. Hopefully now I'll be on hand to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for listening.